Okay, let's talk about jump boxes. So what is a jump box? Um, also, sometimes, what is a bastion host? The uh, the terminology is, is used pretty commonly, and they both are essentially the same thing. So um, if you're wondering what a bastion host is or what a jump box is, you're in the right spot, and uh, hopefully you will understand it here in just a few minutes. So let's get to it. Uh, before we talk about what a jump box is, let's briefly talk about uh, the problem that exists that jump boxes are trying to solve. This is a pretty typical application architecture. It uh, doesn't really need to be complex for what we're doing today, uh, but this is a very realistic uh, kind of real world production app architecture. Uh, so you can see the uh, user traffic starts at the internet, comes in, hits a load balancer, which distributes the traffic among three or more replicas. In this case, there are three. And uh, each one of those replicas uh, also has a database that servers that they talk to. And that's where the application state is stored. So they need to get that. And they return answers to the user. So pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, so let's, um, let's simplify it down a little bit here. And uh, just think about these as uh, you know, the, the three, distinct, three distinct things. So uh, we've got a load balancer, a web server, and a database server. Uh, before we put a firewall in, so we'll say we've just provisioned these and they're fresh new VMs on our cloud provider and they don't really do anything yet. So there's currently no firewall in place. So all the ports are accessible and some of the big ones to think about are 22, which is for SSH, and 80 and 443, which are for HTTP. So everything is reachable and uh, that's that's good for the very first part because if it wasn't, you would have a very hard time configuring these machines. So this is kind of how it starts. But what we want it to look like is like this, uh, at least for, uh, for port 22, this is how we want it to look from the internet. Any machine with a public internet facing IP address is continually being scanned over and over and over by bots that just do nothing but sweep the internet of all addressable address space and look for hosts that are alive and respond. And when those hosts do respond, these uh, these bots will typically uh, try to fingerprint or get you know figure out what what's running on that machine, what version it is, and if it's something that they have an exploit for, then they'll often uh, continue things and turn it into part of a botnet. Um, but they don't. Uh, if they don't see anything, then they'll usually just move on. So uh, for that reason, we want our application to look like this from the internet. A uh, user tries to reach out to port 22 or tries to do a port scan and it, it's not, it's dead. It, there's nothing there uh, because it's firewalled off. And so that's, that's our ideal look for these. Um, but obviously this comes with a big problem or a, a big downside rather in that, how do we get to it? You know, we need to SSH to it and that's a legitimate use case. And uh, if we can't SSH to it, then we can't do maintenance and there's a whole host of problems that, that come up. Uh, so we have a bit of a problem. And uh, the solution here is to essentially use a jump host or jump box or bastion host or however you want to, uh, to call it. Uh, but uh, let's, let's first talk about why you would want to use a hardened host for SSH. Um, so let's go back and uh, Let's go back and look at our, our diagram here real quick. So the uh, each one of these machines has their primary service running. So in the case of the load balancer, it's you know probably nginx or ha proxy, and the web server, it's you know probably nginx or uh, you know depending on the Tomcat maybe <laughs> if you're uh, in the Java world, and then database server which is running Postgres, and and those are the primary jobs for those machines to do. But in order to to SSH into them there also has to be an SSH service that's running as well. So that means each one of these machines has a potentially vulnerable SSH service that is listening. And each one has to be maintained separately and patched aggressively. And that means that each one of these machines has potentially uh, an attack surface with you know, two things, uh, SSH plus whatever service that they're running that they are performing the service for. Uh, that's that's not ideal. You know, ideally we want we only want to expose what we really need to expose. So ideally, we don't want to have SSH on here. Now, there's no way around that really because we need it. Um, but what we can do is 
uh, structure it such that only what needs to be accessible from the internet is accessible from the internet, and the rest are kind of sheltered. So let's go back to um, our desired look. So you know, for, for port 22, this is kind of what we want it to look like. And um, for completeness, we can also peek at the application port firewall. Um, you know, as, as I mentioned, we only want what absolutely needs to be accessible to the internet to be accessible. So in the case of our database server, there's really no legitimate reason for traffic to come from the internet. Um, and normally, um, you know, with, with the jump box uh, in place, it is. Um, so we can block, uh, you know, port 5432, which is Postgres, and uh, just allow that traffic from only the web server, which is the only legitimate user, generally speaking. And same with port 80 on the web server, the load balancer should be the only thing that is talking to the web server directly. So we don't need port 80 to be exposed. So from the internet, the only one that would have an open port that is reachable would be the load balancer, which is our legitimate entry point. So if we think about our problem here and how do we accomplish this, uh, this is where the idea of a jump box comes in. So that will look kind of something like this. Uh, from the internet, there's this uh, this jump box here, and uh, the only thing that it has accessible to it is port 22, which is SSH. From the internet, looking at the database server and the load balancer, port SSH or port 22 for SSH is blocked, and that's good. You know, that's that's kind of what we want. But from traffic from the jump box on 22 is allowed to the database server, web server, and the load balancer. So the idea here is that we can largely obtain a view like this one, which is what we want. We can largely obtain that by using this jump box as a proxy. So if a legitimate user, us, needs to SSH to do maintenance on one of these servers back here, we can go from the internet to the jump box, and then from the jump box, we can get to where we need. And by dividing it up this way, we essentially make it such that each one of these machines is not nearly as vulnerable. It doesn't have nearly the attack surface that it would if SSH was running on each of these individually. And that can be beneficial for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, a big one is that we, particularly with SSH, we want to install all security patches as soon as possible, as soon as they come out, essentially. And uh, when, when you do that with uh, some of these other machines, like the web server, the database server, it's it's kind of an all or nothing thing. Uh, typically, you know, you you're kind of at the mercy of what your distribution package is. So, uh, in order to install those updates right away, you also are going to be updating your database software or your web software, and that's usually not what you want to do because if a bad software update comes down, it could bring down your app, and that's that's not good. So, you you need to be a little more conservative with installing patches and testing updates with these servers. But with the jump box, you don't. It's a um, you know, worst case scenario, if the jump box went down because of a bad update, your application still runs. And uh, you can also do a highly available setup here where you have uh, you know, three jump boxes. So uh, that way, if one of them gets uh, trashed, you can still get it. But um, using this method, you, you kind of divide up the, the needs here. So that way you can very aggressively update this jump box. In fact, uh, most people will set it to automatically update and it'll just it'll just take whatever comes down the pipe and throw it in there. And uh, and then you don't need to worry about it as much with these individual services. Now, you obviously you still do want to make sure you're installing security updates for these other machines and, and their SSH because there is an SSH daemon on there. The firewall prevents it from being seen from the internet, but hypothetically, if the jump box was compromised, then uh, from there, they could compromise these machines if they're not being kept up to date. So it's um, it doesn't remove the need to keep things updated, but it uh, it does, it, it's defense in depth is, uh, is the idea that we have. Okay, so uh, once we have our uh, jump box in place, and it's been created and deployed, our total firewall configuration will look something like this. So from the internet, you can see that uh, reach, getting directly to the database or the web server is not possible. The only way to get to any of the services that are running on here is to go through the jump box for port 22 for SSH, or to go through the load balancer for legitimate user traffic, such as HTTP, 
uh, loading web pages or uh, calling out to a REST API or something like that. Using this setup and this strategy, we essentially can divide the burden among these. So we've only got one jump box to, in this particular scenario. We've only got one jump box that has to be maintained. And uh, it's a lot simpler to administer when it's just an SSH machine. And so we can keep that thing very aggressively updated. And uh, that gives us a little bit more flexibility to do proper testing on our database and our web server updates before we roll those out. So from the jump box, we can SSH over port 22 to any of our machines that are on the back end, but uh, we cannot get to them directly from the internet. We can also further lock this down in our, with our firewall because uh, we know that for the database server, the only legitimate source of traffic is the jump box for port 22. If some SSH is coming from the web server to the database server, that's not legitimate, so we can block that. And the only legitimate traffic for 5432 for the database will come from the web server itself. So we can get very specific with our firewall configuration here. And same with the web server, the only valid source for port 22 to come from is the jump box, not the load balancer, not the database server, and certainly not the internet. And uh, the only legitimate source for traffic on 80 or 443 for the web server is the load balancer. And for the load balancer, we can tighten that one down such that only 80 and 443, the two ports that we need user traffic to be accessible on, are allowed. And uh, 22, the only legitimate source is the jump box. So uh, with this configuration, we're, uh, we've got a, a much tighter setup and we're only allowing what's really needed. And we've got a separate jump box that we can use to essentially s stand in the way. And it's, it's often called a bastion host because uh, it kind of acts as a bastion in, in this case. So um, if somebody was going to try to compromise our machines uh, over SSH, they first have to compromise this jump box, and then they have to compromise the machine on the back end, which is significantly more difficult to do than simply compromising them directly. So uh, I hope that helps you understand what a jump box is or why it matters. And uh, thanks for watching.